All right, there we go. And we are in business. All right, thank you all for your patience. Apologies for that delay there. I'm going to go through a couple of slides here just to welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining today's web event. Again, my name is William Moore with OJJDP's Intact. Uh, today's web event is the OJJDP FY 2021 Mentoring for Youth Affected by the Opioid Crisis and Drug Addiction. Uh, please note that this web event is not on the content area of mentoring for youth affected by the opioid in crisis and uh, drug addiction, but instead it will be focusing on the grant solicitation for the fiscal year of 2021. So I want to make sure that our audience is uh, clear about today's web event. Please note that today's web event is indeed being recorded. We will post the uh, web event on our YouTube page, the OJJDP's multimedia page. On here, you will find additional webinars that you can view. If you would like any supporting materials, you can reach out to the TTA Help Desk and we can get you those materials. For individuals who are connecting, please make sure that you have the WebEx system to dial out to your phone that is the best way to connect and have the clearest audio for today's web event. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, send me a private chat and I'll help to troubleshoot any issues that you may have. So during today's web event, we will take live questions about the solicitation. So when you submit your uh, question, please go to the chat and type in your question. Before you send, make sure that the in the to box or the send to box, you have either everyone or all panelists selected. Again, everyone or all panelists in order for us to receive your question. And then you can hit enter or send and we will receive your question. Really quickly, we would like for folks to help us count. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing in a group, meaning it's yourself and an, uh, multiple individuals, please indicate the total number of additional people in the room with you today. So if you're viewing, say, with your program manager, you will type plus one to indicate the additional person or people that are in the room with you today. So you can go to the chat and you can type that in now to type in the uh, total number of additional people that are in the room. Again, if you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. All right, so that being said, um, hmm, sorry, it looks like we have the, oh, OJP uh, organizational chart here. Um, and sorry, Carrie, you may have to go back to that chart if you want to display that, but I will now turn it over to our moderator, Carrie, for today's web event. And Carrie, I am uh, passing you the virtual ball here for you to um, take over the presentation whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you very much, William. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carrie Strug, and I'm a program manager in the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And um, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about um, the 2021 Mentoring for Youth Affected by the Opioid Crisis and Drug Addiction Solicitation. So first off, um, you know, OJJDP is part of OJP. There's some other offices you might um, be interested in their solicitations as well. Um, OJJDP's vision, uh, we envision a nation where our children are free from crime and violence, and if they do indeed come into contact with the system, uh, the contact should be both just and beneficial to them. So what is our mission? Um, OGJDP provides national leadership, coordination, and resources to prevent and respond to juvenile delinquency and victimization. We support the efforts of states, tribes, and communities to develop and implement effective and equitable juvenile justice systems that enhance public safety, ensure youth are held appropriately accountable to both crime victims and communities, and also empower youth to live productive, law-abiding lives. So what are the objectives of today's webinar? Um, we want to provide all of you a general overview of this year's 
mentoring for youth affected by the opioid crisis and drug addiction solicitation. We will highlight some key eligibility and solicitation requirements, identify tools and resources for you all, the applicants that will facilitate the application process. And then at the end, we will provide an opportunity for applicants to ask questions. So our general mentoring overview, um, mentoring promotes positive behaviors, attitudes, and outcomes for youth and reduces risk factors. Mentoring has been shown to improve academic performance and social job skills, support behavioral and other personal development, and it reduces the consumption of alcohol and other drugs. Successful mentoring programs include matches between a mentor and one or more youth. Uh, mentoring can take place in multiple and informal settings, so like in a school, community. What are the primary goals of OGGDP's various mentoring programs? Uh, we want to promote the expansion of high quality mentoring services for at-risk youth across the nation. And we want to reduce juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and other problematic and high-risk behaviors, such as truancy. So this specific mentoring solicitation, the 2021 Mentoring for Youth Affected by the Opioid Crisis and Drug Addiction, here's some uh, dates that you should be familiar with. Um, the first one was when the solicitation was released, January 15th. But um, those highlighted here, this year, it's a two-step process. And so the first deadline to submit your application is in grants.gov, and that's on March 30th. Then the second deadline is for just grants, and that will be April 13th. All awards will be in the form of a grant. And project periods, as you will see in the solicitation, state that they're for 36 months. However, I want to acknowledge that these project periods can actually range from 18 to 36 months. All recipients and subrecipients must forgo any profit or management fee, and all applicants must initiate mentoring services to youth who are 17 years old or younger at the time of admission to the program. So there are two different categories under this solicitation. The first one is mentoring strategies for youth impacted by opioids and drug addiction, and it's specific to project sites. Whereas category two is statewide and regional mentoring strategies for youth impacted by opioids and drug addiction. So some program specific information. Uh, the program supports the implementation and delivery of mentoring services to youth who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs, youth at risk for abusing drugs, and also youth with family members who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs. Mentoring services can be one-to-one, -one, group, peer, or a combination of these. Funding can be used to support new mentoring matches or continue existing mentoring matches at the time of application. Funding may be used to support supplemental activities as part of the proposed mentoring model. However, this funding can only be up to 20% of the total amount of project funds that you can use to support other non-mentoring direct services. These include mental health, substance abuse treatment, residential placement services, or some other supportive services identified and those that align with your project design. Applicants are expected to include a fully executed mentoring program profile document as part of their application. So um, this is something new this year. You are expected to complete that program profile. So what's the program goals? Uh, the goal is to improve outcomes, such as improved academic performance and reduce school dropout rates for youth impacted by opioids and drug addiction through mentoring. The program objectives 
are to expand the capacity of existing mentoring programs, to provide high quality services to youth that reduce drug abuse, delinquency, or other problem behaviors. Also to promote the development of innovative approaches to mentoring youth impacted by opioids and drug addiction. What are the program deliverables? So programs will enhance and or expand their mentoring services to meet the needs of youth impacted by opioids and drug addiction. Programs will expand capacity and increase implementation of quality standards based on the elements of effective practice. Programs will develop services for mentees and their families to address opioid or drug addiction issues. And also programs in category one, those project sites, will partner with substance abuse treatment agencies to meet the needs presented by the target population of youth. So now I'm gonna go through both categories and just reiterate, you know, take what was in the solicitation um, and tell you more about the budget amount, eligibility, as well as the priority considerations. So for the first category, category one, mentoring strategies for youth impacted by opioids and drug addiction, the project sites. Um, this category provides mentoring services as part of a prevention, treatment, and supportive approach for youth impacted by unlawful or addictive drug use. The funding is up to $625,000, and that's for the total length of the award. That's not per year. That's for, you know, up to a 36-month period. Um, so that's the total amount. One award will not receive more than that. Um, and OJJDP anticipates making up to 14 awards for this category. So we've been asked in the past, what does impacted youth mean? And so it's youth who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs, youth at high risk for abusing drugs, or youth with family members who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs. Okay, so for the project site category one, we encourage applicant mentoring organizations to establish a formal relationship with a public or private substance abuse treatment agency. And this should include a fully executed memorandum of understanding or an analogous document between the agencies. It is not required at the time of application. Applicants, um, need to though describe their partnership and importance to the program model. Applicants that do indeed submit a fully executed memorandum of understanding or another analogous document will receive priority consideration. So who is eligible? Um, eligible applicants are limited to nonprofit organizations and poor profit organizations including tribal nonprofit and for-profit organizations, as well as faith-based organizations. OGJDP will consider applications under which two or more entities would carry out the federal award. However, only one entity can be the applicant. Any others will be proposed as subrecipients. The applicant must have operated an established mentoring program for at least one full calendar year. Again, um, in the attachment section, you should provide a mentoring organizational history document that demonstrates the time frame for when the organization has provided mentoring services. So OJP has some priority areas for consideration for category one and two. Um, I think last year was the first time that we had these OJP policy priority areas, and they are continuing again. It's um, applicants that address specific challenges that rural communities face, applications that demonstrate that the individuals who are intended to benefit from the requested grant reside in high poverty areas or persistent poverty counties, 
and also applicants that offer enhancements to public safety in economically distressed communities, which we refer to as Qualified Opportunity Zones, or QOZs. All right, moving on to Category 2, the statewide and regional mentoring strategies for youth impacted by opioids and drug addiction. This category supports a broad-based approach to building mentoring program capacity in targeted regions throughout the country to help youth impacted by unlawful or addictive drug use. This funding is up to $1,250,000 per award, and OJJDP expects to make up to six awards this fiscal year. Much like Category 1, we want to define what impacted youth includes. It's youth who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs, youth at high risk for abusing drugs, as well as youth with family members who are currently abusing or addicted to drugs. All right, so who is eligible to apply for Category 2? Um, these applicants are limited to national organizations, which we define as organizations that have active chapters or sub-awardees in at least 45 states. It's also um, eligible for states, including territories, uh, federally recognized tribal governments, and also mentoring organizations that have a statewide reach. So what does state mean? For purposes of this solicitation, it means any state of the United States, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, the American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So organizations that believe they have a statewide REACH are expected to submit an attachment labeled Mentoring Organizational Capacity, which should demonstrate and provide us evidence that the organization has supported or operated mentoring programs on a statewide basis. Again, um, these are the OJP policy priority areas, and they pertain to Category 2 as well. Applicants that address specific challenges that rural communities face, applicants that demonstrate that the individuals who are intended to benefit from the requested grant reside in high poverty areas or persistent poverty counties, as well as applications that offer enhancements to public safety in economically distressed communities or QOZs. If you provide information regarding your application that you, you know, fit into these OJP policy priority areas, you will get priority consideration. So um, now I'm just going to give a general overview of oh. excuse me, I'm not sure what happened here. There we go. Oh goodness. Can anybody hear me? Yes, I can still <coughs> hear you here, Carrie. Are um, you experiencing issues in the VDI there? I don't see anything on my screen, and it shows me I'm the only participant, so I apologize for these mm. technical it, uh, issues. It may be, can, yeah, it may be WebEx, and I can move the slides for you here, Carrie. That would be fantastic. Thank you, William. Sure, no problem. Uh, we're at general overview of OJJDP grant application uh, process. Oh, here we go. Um, so this is the general overview. Um, I think, actually, I'm back. Um, of the yes. application and submission information. So, you know, there's certain application elements that you will definitely need to provide. Um, and these are listed here. So the application elements are the standard form, the SF-424, the standard applicant information, the project abstract, the program narrative, budget information and those associated documentation, the executive summary chart, and for those applicants um, 
in Category 1, you need that MOU or an analogous document with a substance abuse treatment agency. If you have an indirect cost rate agreement, you will want to provide that. And um, also, you'll want to submit your financial management and system of internal controls questionnaire. So you'll see some of these are in bold, and that's because those are, like, needed. Those documents you have to submit in order to move on um, for peer review. So these are, we call them basic minimum requirements. And you'll see in quotes, um, the executive summary chart, it is listed in the solicitation as additional, but it is a BMR requirement, like it is needed in order to move forward into peer review. So I'm gonna go through each one of these, the SF-424, it's a required standard form, used as a cover sheet for submission of pre-applications, applications, and related information. So the standard application information, um, this section of the Just Grants application is pre-populated with your SF-424 data submitted in grants.gov. Applicants will need to review the standard application information in Just Grants and make edits as needed. Um, in this section, applicants will need to add their zip codes for areas affected by the project. You need to confirm your authorized representative as well as verify the organization's legal name and address. Uh, so then next um, required element of the application is the project abstract. This should be no more than 400 words, and the abstract should summarize the proposed project. You should include primary activities, products, and deliverables, the service area, and who will benefit from the proposed project. And um, this will be completed in the Just Grants web-based form this year. Uh, the program narrative, there is a 30-page limit on the program narrative. And within it, you need to have a description of the issue, the project design and implementation, your capabilities and competencies, as well as the plan for collecting the data required for this solicitation's performance measures. And once again, um, for category one, you need that MOU or, um, you know, letters of support in terms of that relationship with a substance abuse treatment agency. All right, so now we'll go through each of these categories. Um, description of the issue. Um, you should briefly describe the nature and scope of the problem that your program will address. You should use data to provide evidence that the problem exists, demonstrate the size and scope of the problem, document the effects of the problem on the target population and the larger community. Any data or research reference in the narrative should include information about the source of the data and or a citation. And applicants should describe the target population and any previous or current attempt that's been made to address the problem or project design and implementation. Applicants should detail how the project will operate throughout the funding period, and you should describe the strategies that will you, you will use to achieve the goals and objectives. You should describe how you will complete the deliverables stated in the goals, objectives, and deliverables section of the solicitation. Applicants should also include details regarding average, any leveraged resources from local sources to support the project and discuss plans for sustainability beyond the grant period. Lastly, for this section, applicants should provide a realistic timeline that indicates major tasks associated with the goals and objectives of the project. This timeline is submitted as an attachment. It does not need to be within your 30-page limit. So moving on to capabilities and competencies, you should describe the experience and the capability of your organization and any contractors or subgrantees that will be used to implement and manage the effort. And um, associate federal funding, have any previous experience implementing projects of similar design or magnitude. 
Applicants should include an organizational chart showing how the organization operates. Um, we want to know who manages the finances, how the organization manages subawards, if that's applicable to you, and um, who's going to, you know, manage this proposed project. This organizational chart can be submitted as an attachment. Applicants should describe how they meet each of the qualifications outlined under the eligibility section or the category under which they are applying. And you should describe your experience providing mentoring practices informed by the research of a similar scope and scale. Once again, category one, project sites applicants should include a document attached labeled mentoring organizational history. So your plan for collecting the data required for this solicitation performance measures, you should describe the process for measuring project performance. You should identify who will collect the data, who is responsible for the performance measurements, and how the information will be used to guide and evaluate the impact of the project. You should also describe the process that will be used to accurately report your data to us. And again, just a friendly reminder for category one only, um, the lead application organization should include assigned and dated letters of support or memorandum of understanding or an analogous document with a substance abuse treatment agency, which includes the following, so expression of support for the program, a willingness to participate and collaborate, a description of the partner's current role and responsibilities in the planning process and expected responsibilities when the program is operational, um, and the estimate of the percentage of time that the partner will devote to the planning and operation of the project. Okay, the next um, required element of the application is the budget worksheet and budget narrative. This year it is a web-based form in just grant. The budget narrative should thoroughly and clearly describe every category of expense listed in the budget detail worksheet. We expect the proposed budget to be complete cost-effective and allowable. Again, awards will be in the form of a grant. There is no match requirement. And applicants are expected to budget funds to support as many as two staff to travel once each year of the project to participate in a two-day national meeting as OJJVP directs. So you should budget approximately $2,000 per person. Uh, the executive summary chart, this element of the application is listed in the additional application component section of the solicitation. However, I want to reiterate that this, the executive summary chart, must be included in the application submission for an application to meet the BMR requirements and advance to peer review to receive consideration for funding. And so what do you need to put in the executive summary chart? Uh, for both category one and two, we want to know the number of youth to be served. This includes new youth to the program as well as continuations. Um, and we want to know the number of mentors to be recruited and maintained. And for category two, in addition to that, you need to provide the number and name of jurisdictions where you have provided mentoring services as well as the number and name of the jurisdictions where the mentoring services will take place specifically under the grant award. So in addition to the elements that are required um, for your application, there's some additional application components. Um, tribal authorizing resolution, if that's applicable to you the research and evaluation independence and integrity statement. If it's applicable, the documentation of rural challenges. Again, if it's applicable to you and your organization, the documentation of high poverty areas or persistent poverty counties. And then again, if it's applicable, the last OJP priority consideration documentation of enhanced public safety in the QOZ zone. Um, then for category one, you should have that attachment regarding mentoring organizational history. And then for category two, it is a mentoring organizational 
capacity. And um, as we stated, this year is the first time that you are required to also fill out and provide a mentoring program profile. In addition, um, there's the disclosure of lobbying activities that you want to submit, the DOJ certified standard assurance form, applicant disclosure of duplication and cost items, DOJ certifications regarding lobbying, department suspension, and other responsibility matters and drug free workplace requirements, as well as if it's applicable to you, the applicant disclosure and justification of your DOG, excuse me, DOJ high risk, if you're a high risk grantee. So, where do you apply? How? Again, this year, the two-step process is different. Um, you will need to submit your SF-424 and your SFLLL, that's the um, lobbying certification in grants.gov, and you need to do this prior to March 30th. Then the step two is to submit your full application, including all your attachments in Just Grants prior to April 13th, 2021. For additional information, please see the how to apply section in the OJP grant application resource guide. A lot of valuable information in the OJP grant application resource guide. So this is the review criteria. This is how applications will be scored. Description of the issue, 20%. Project design and implementation, 35%. Capabilities and competencies, 30%. Your plan for collecting the data required for this solicitation's performance measures is 10%. And then the budget is at 5%. Again, with your budget, you need to make sure it's cost effective and that the amount of direct services for funding um, makes sense and is appropriate. So how do we review the application process? So applications that meet that BMR requirement, you know, the basic minimum requirement, will be evaluated for technical merit by our peer review panel in accordance with OJP peer review policy and procedures. We also have other important considerations such as geographic diversity, strategic priorities. We've um, kind of gone over this in terms of those that are related to addressing specific challenges that rural communities face, high poverty areas or persistent poverty counties, as well as the QOZ zones. Um, other important considerations is available funding, past performance, and the extent to which the budget worksheet and budget narrative accurately explain project cost. Pursuant to the Part 200 uniform requirements before award decisions are made, OJP also reviews information related to the degree of risk that's posed by the applicant. Among other things, to help assess whether an applicant has won or more prior federal awards, has a satisfactory record with respect to performance, integrity and business ethics, OJP checks whether the applicant is listed in CM and is excluded from receiving a federal award. So if you need technical assistance with grants.gov, um, this is the number in the link. They are operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, except for federal holidays. Um, there are no late applications accepted unless there's a problem on OGGDP's end with grants.gov. Um, a problem with grants.gov on the applicant side will not result in a waiver to submit things late. We highly encourage all of you to sign up early to get email notifications regarding the solicitation. Um, I do know that we're on version three of this solicitation thus far. So when things are modified, individuals who sign up with grants.gov for updates are automatically notified, whereas others, you know, don't get anything. You'll have to keep checking it yourself. 
Um, and then this year, because you are submitting your full application in the Just Grants system, this is the number you should be calling for assistance. Um, the help desk operates from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., Monday through Friday, and then 9 to 5 on the weekends. And here are some resources if you're new to applying for OJP funds. Again, I think I said the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide is extremely helpful. I would encourage all of you to take a look at that. Just Grants, this is new. Um, familiarize yourself in terms of what you need to do to get that application in on time. If you need grant writing tips, these links can be very helpful. And then um, we really like all of our mentoring applicants to check in with the National Mentoring Resource Center. There's a lot of valuable information there. Um, of course, today there's a lot of different media platforms. We encourage all of you to stay up to date and to connect with OJGDP, and these are all the different ways that you can um, be up to speed with what we are doing, where the money is going, what solicitations are out, um, what webinars are coming up, things like that. And so now that's the end of my presentation, and I'm happy to try and answer some questions that have come in that are specific to the solicitation. Great. Thank you, Carrie. And um, for our audience that's there, um, before we get into questions, uh, just a couple of announcements that I mentioned earlier that I believe some people may have uh, missed because we had several to submit them. Uh, but please note that, yes, we are recording today's web event. Um, everyone who came in, please note you did come in on mute, so no need to worry about uh, being off mute. You came in on mute during today's web event, um, so to those who asked that question. Also, uh, to the others who've asked, uh, yes, you have access to the PDF of today's web event that includes those links, and the PDF uh, is indeed in that uh, Google Drive link that we um, provided in the chat that my co-host provided in the chat. Um, Alyssa, I'll ask if you can repost that again maybe in a little bit so folks can get access to that. Um, so for those who sent me the IMs or, excuse me, direct messages about um, that, I just wanted to make sure that that was uh, cleared for those who joined. Um, so in that regard, the other thing I wanted to mention to folks is please be advised that we will try to get to as many questions as we can, but if you did not get your question answered today, um, please note that we have the response center information on this slide here, uh, and this is where you can send in your questions uh, either via phone or by email to the response center to have them answered. All right, so just want to get that out the way. Um, Carrie, our first question, uh, or a group of questions, excuse me, will come uh, in regards to eligibility that we received. Um, are public agencies eligible uh, for example, a county program eligible to apply for Category 1? So for Category 1, the project site um, under eligibility, I highly recommend that you take a look um, at what we stated there because it is pretty specific in terms of who is eligible, nonprofit organizations for-profit organizations, which includes tribal nonprofit and for-profit organizations, um, as well as faith-based organizations, but only those that have an operational mentoring program that has been provided for at least one full year. Okay. And yes, I believe that answered this question as well, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, Carrie, they asked or mentioned that they were a nonprofit organization uh, for peer-to-peer -peer support for children who have been impacted by loved ones with uh, SUD, with uh, substance use disorder, um, and they want to know if they would qualify for this, uh, to apply for the grant. Okay, again, um, I recommend you check out the eligibility section. So um, for project sites, it's nonprofit organizations and for-profit organizations. But this includes tribal nonprofit and for-profit organizations as well as faith-based organizations. 
um, that at the time of application have had an operational mentoring program that's been providing services for at least one full year. Great. Um, let's see, someone mentioned that they were a mentoring program that currently use, uh, that we are using another youth population. Um, we have a mentoring program, excuse me, currently that we are using for another youth population. Do we qualify for this grant award or do we need to have a mentoring program that is specific to youth described in this RFP? So you need to have an operational mentoring program for at least one full calendar year. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Um, the next set of questions are around clarification uh, or even the categories here, um, and even more so maybe some of the definitions. Uh, someone asked, is there a more specific guidance on the PMT questions for category two? They mentioned that they went to the resource guide, however, it didn't break down any uh, specifics and they want to make sure that their proposal is reflective of this. So you want to, um, in your application, tell us about your program and the performance measures that pertain to your program model. There are specific um, performance measurement surveys, like, a, you know, questions that you will have to respond to if awarded. Um, but if certain things do not apply to your program, then that's okay. Um, so we are currently in the process of revising our performance measures. And so therefore, if it's not currently listed, that might be why. Um, but I encourage you to you know, follow the solicitation and provide us what performance measures you will be assessing with your program. Carrie, someone uh, asked about the executed mentoring profile. Specifically, they wanted to know if the executed mentoring profile document is for both categories. Yes, all applicants need to submit that with their application. Okay. Uh, someone wanted to know what constitutes uh, a public or private substance abuse treatment agency. Does a family counselor who specializes in substance abuse qualify? So I think if you have, you know, really specific individual questions, you should send them to the response center that, so that we can um, get a little bit more details and provide the appropriate response. Um, you know, as stated in the solicitation, you are required to, for category one, the project site, um, you know, have a formal relationship with the substance abuse agency and how an organization defines that and how it's within their program model may differ. Um, so that's part of the application process is for you to, you know, justify and tell us and explain what you have in mind to um, have a sound program that has positive impact. And just a reminder to our audience, please note, again, the response center information is on the current slide that is being displayed with the telephone number and email address. Um, let's see, does statewide reach include telemedicine programs? So, and that may be uh, for response as well, but. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna need some yeah. <laughs> more um, explanation in terms of our current climate with the pandemic. Um, you know, we are aware that many organizations are adapting and changing and do have a virtual platform. Um, however, I need more information in terms of what your program design is. So please um, submit to the Response Center if you need further information. Okay. Let's see, uh, someone wanted to know, could a uh, federally qualified um, health center, F FQHC, 
with a substance use disorder treatment service meet the requirement of a partner substance use treatment program? Uh, will this work if mentoring program is also under the um, FQHC umbrella, federally qualified health center or clinic? So again, you want to look at the eligibility criteria, if this is for category one, um, which I believe it is because you're stating, you know, that's the one we require that you have um, a relationship. So I'm not sure, can you provide a little bit more clarity in terms of what you're asking? Right. And again, for, for the audience, uh, please note that we have the response center information here on the slide. Um, and Carrie, uh, another question about online mentoring programs came in. I believe you answered it uh, earlier, uh, but they mentioned that they have an online mentoring program that services uh, 45 states and um, that they have local partnerships with prisons in these states to refer children to of incarcerated parents to their online program. Uh, they don't have any subawardees uh, for the states, but they want to see if they qualify as an organization under um, the definition of the solicitation. Well, as we define um, for category two, um, please do check out the eligibility section and you'll see how we define um, its national organizations defined as organizations that have active chapters or sub-awardees in at least 45 states. So active chapters or sub-awardees in at least 45 states. Okay, and again, um, this is the last question we have in the category of uh, definition. Someone asked, uh, does a drug addicted, and they put drug addicted in uh, quotations here, include most stimulants and not just opioids, are any drugs excluded? Yes, you, you may, um, you know, work with those youth that are impacted not only by opioids, but other drug addiction. Okay. Um, the next set of questions here, it looks like it's on uh, uh, specifications around age. Uh, could uh, you state the age limit or range again? They, they may have uh, missed it, but someone asked about basically what was the age limit or range for youth in the programs and then uh, uh, they wanted to know if it was maybe 17 or older or if you could include youth who were older, basically, so 18, 19, 20, 21, et cetera. So it needs to be that the youth enters the program um, under the age of 18, but these are for an 18 to 36 month period. So, you know, if, if the, um, the youth is aging above that, it's okay. We're not gonna kick them out of the program, but that doesn't mean you can have somebody come into the program and start it, you know, with the mission of the program be over 18 years of age. Okay. Uh, the next, uh, well, one question here that we received, it looks like it was around uh, MOU. Is the letters, is it letters of support from community and the MOU with treatment services or a letter of support can substitute for the MOU? It looks like they're asking for a and or situation with letters of support versus MOUs here. Right, so um, at the time of application, you just need to be able to um, show that you have a clear relationship but those with an MOU will get priority consideration. Once or if you are awarded, a special condition will be placed on your award until you can provide that MOU or analogous document, you know, showing um, that both parties are fully committed, able, and ready to go. The next set of questions are around um, 
technical or uh, just grants related. Um, before I ask a couple of these questions, I want to remind the audience that in the slides that you're able to access here includes that information that Carrie showed earlier that has uh, the information for just grants. So if uh, you download that and you get access to those documents, uh, it also includes that information for just grants. So I wanted to remind the audience of that before we get into these uh, questions here. Um, so it looks like someone asked, do we need to submit full application two times on two different dates? No. no. So the first, um, the grants.gov submission is just your SF-424 and your SF-LLL. The rest of your application is going to go in just grants. Okay. Um, this is a little lengthy. I'll try to do my best to, to read it here. Again, want to remind the audience that uh, information that was showed earlier is indeed accessible through the uh, PowerPoint. Um, Alyssa, go ahead and post that link again for folks, um, just in case people did not get a chance to download or get access to that. Uh, since the grants.gov piece is due before the Just Grants uploading, uh, can we post date the intergovernment review intergovernmental review submitted date uh, for that question on the SF424. And let me know if I need to repeat that um, for you, Carrie. Yeah, I mean, um, I would highly recommend that um, if you're a new applicant, we have a, a Just Grants help desk and a team that is providing webinars on the application process. And um, they know, you know, those specific technical questions um, because I'm not really sure I understand what you're asking. Um, the first deadline is, you know, grants.gov and it's for two specific forms, everything else is, um, you know, for that second deadline date of um, April 13th. And so that's the bulk of your application that you'll be submitting in Just Grants. And someone asked, is grants.gov the only way to get updates? that will automatically um, go into your email um, when changes to the solicitation are made? I do believe so. Okay. See, these final questions here, Carrie, um, and these will be our last questions um, uh, coming in for today. Uh, someone asked, can we provide any kind of financial stipend or thank you gifts to volunteer mentors? Um, I recommend you check out the DOJ financial guide. Um, pending upon your program design, um, you know, if awarded, this is something that you could get prior approval from your program manager, but typically, um, like food costs, incentives, things like that. Um, you know, we suggest that organizations find other means versus federal dollars. However, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, you can explain your rationale and, you know, submit um, request special approval for certain costs if it makes sense and seems you know, an integral part of your program design. Okay. Someone mentioned that they were a multi-service organization. Uh, one of the services they provide is substance abuse screening, assessment, and treatment. They want to know if they still need to partner with a substance abuse agency. Well, are you a mentoring program? Right. Or a um, you, right. You, you need to make sure you're eligible to apply 
you have that mentoring component as well as, okay. you know, that you're a substance abuse treatment provider. <laughs> uh, someone just asked if they could submit letters of support. Yes, you're always welcome to um, yeah. to do that and to, you know, add them as attachments with your application. For the um, national meeting that you mentioned, do we need to budget $2,000 per person for all three years? Yep, that is correct, yes. Okay. Uh, is grants, oh, okay, we are getting into uh, <laughs> some of the, the repeats there. Um, so that being said, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I think that's all of the questions, uh, again, because some of them were repeating and we tried to do our best to answer as many questions that came in, especially those that were repeated. So, uh, Carrie, I just want to check with you. Are there any last uh, items that you want to direct for our audience before we close out? No, um, I am grateful for all of you attending this webinar. I wish you the best um, in this application process. And if further questions or concerns, you know, do come up, please send um, those specific items to the response center and we'll do our best to try and assist you. Um, so thanks very much. Uh, everybody take good care and um, we look forward to seeing your applications in the near future. All right. Thank you, Carrie. And again, uh, as Carrie mentioned to our audience, we do have the uh, response center information here on this slide. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the PDF again with folks. So if you didn't get a chance to access it through that um, URL that my co-host um, provided, uh, I'm sharing something that it should say file transfer that pops up on as a box in your uh, window in WebEx. That does include the PDF that we're sharing for today, and so please feel free to download that and access it um, with no problem. Um, so. Uh, just uh, reminding folks that here's the information here uh, regarding Just Grants. Again, when you uh, download the document, you will get that uh, clickable link inside of here where you can click on it to get more information. If you're looking to get more information about INTAC, uh, you can feel free to go to our site here or sign up for our listserv to learn more about web events that we have. Also, be sure to go to Facebook and like us on Facebook at OJJDP TTA. For any uh, questions, um, including uh, any assistance with, again, the access of materials, if this share file, uh, option didn't work for you, if the um, other I item here, the URL didn't work um, for you, then that's totally fine. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, have you to to send in any of your uh, items to the help desk at this information here. Uh, please be sure to check out OJJDP's website that we have here as well. Sign up for their listserv and be sure to check out their upcoming events as well. Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, please be sure to submit a TTA uh, request via the TTA 360 platform. The URL to access that platform is on this slide. Again, we are recording today's event. If you would like to get uh, see that recording plus other webinars related to juvenile justice and child victimization prevention, then please feel free to go to OJJDP's multimedia page. Accessing any supporting materials related to those web events, contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk at this email address. Please be sure to join us for upcoming uh, web events that we have uh, coming up on the 17th and 24th of this a month with our colleagues at the National District Attorneys Association and also at the Innocent Justice Foundation. Those events are available and ready for you all to register and uh, sign up to attend those web events. Uh, 
We also have web events coming up in March with our colleagues with the Innocent Justice Foundation. Please be sure to go in and actually sign up for uh, those as well. Uh, so that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and put up one more uh, poll for everyone. Uh, let's see. Hmm. And this last poll I'll put up is just a poll that we have in order to uh, get or gauge more information in regards to how do you plan to apply the information that you've learned. Uh, let's see. And let me make sure I can put this poll up for you all. So those who are filing out of the virtual room here, if you could, please uh, take a moment just to submit this and let us know how do you plan to apply the information that you learned here. Please note that this is multiple select uh, for this particular poll, meaning you can select more than one option. So if you go there, it's open. You can select uh, any options that you hear, see here, A through J and it's multiple select, so feel free to select multiple items or options here. I'll leave this poll up for a couple of more seconds for those who are filing out of the virtual room. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining our uh, web event today. Take care and have a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye.